Hello and welcome to Prelims Practice 2020. So in this series, after covering polity, geography, it's time for us to take up the environment. So in the coming two videos, we are going to discuss various questions related to the environment section and accordingly, we will solve few practice questions. After the merger of Indian Forest Services exam with that of UPSC Civil Services exam, the significance of the environment section has increased drastically and hence there is a need to pay special attention to the subject and matters related to the environment portion. So in this brief introductory video, we will first try to understand what is the usual weightage of environment questions and then we will look into what are the various topics in environment portion from where the frequent questions are asked. So let's now start the discussion. So as far as the questions from the past years are concerned, the graph on your screen shows the significance of environment. Anywhere from 10 to going up to 25 questions have been asked out of 100 in UPSC Civil Services Prelims Examination since 2012. You can see that there is a fluctuation in number of questions asked from the environment portion, but nonetheless it has never gone down below 10 questions and it can go up to 20 as well as 25 questions. So, covering environment exhaustively becomes your first task as far as prelims are concerned. So, let's now have a look at various topics from the environment sections which are frequently asked in UPSC prelims examination. So, a very broad categorization of the subjects within environment can be put in this way. A lot of questions has been asked in the past years related to international organizations. For example, Ramsar Convention, UNFCCC and various other such conventions and organizations, their functions, India's association with those organizations and what are the main objectives of such institutions. Similarly, a lot of questions have been asked related to national initiatives like National Tiger Conservation Authority, Wildlife Protection Act. So all those measures which the government of India and various states are taking to safeguard environment, wildlife, biodiversity and to take care of the pollution levels are frequently asked in UPSC examinations. Apart from these two, another important aspect of environment portion is that of static portion of ecology and environment. So the question can be as easy as what is an ecosystem to as difficult as asking you very specific questions related to a cycle of an element for example nitrogen or phosphorus. So another very important aspect of environment is that of map entries and locations. For example, the questions not only deal with the location of a specific tiger reserve or biosphere reserve, but has also asked questions related to what kind of flora and fauna is found in a specific protected area. So it becomes very important for us to cover this topic very exhaustively. So what we have done in these videos is that we have divided these topics into two portions. In the first video, we are going to take up topics international organizations, national initiatives and theories. Whereas in the second video, we are going to discuss species, protected areas, chemical pollutants and possibilities. So let's now start the discussion with questions on international organizations. So starting our discussion with the questions asked in UPSC examination related to international organizations. The first question which we have taken was asked in 2017. Consider the following statements in respect of trade related analysis of fauna and flora in commerce which is abbreviated as traffic. Now statement one read, traffic is a bureau under United Nations Environment Program whereas statement two read, the mission of traffic is to ensure that trade in wild plants and animals is not a threat to the conservation of nature. Now on the first look of the question, both of them appear to be true. But you should always pay great attention to the statements like this, that organization A is a member of B or is a part of B, unless and until you are pretty sure you should not go with that statement. So for example, in this case, Traffic or the Wildlife Trade Monitoring Network is the leading non-governmental organization working globally on the trade of wild animals and plants in the context of both biodiversity and their sustainable development. And hence, 
स्टेटमेंट वन इज इन करेक्ट एज इट इज नॉट अ ब्यूरो अंडर यूनाइटेड नेशन एनवायरमेंट प्रोग्राम एंड द स्टेटमेंट टू इज ऑब्वियसली करेक्ट विच कैन बी इजिली डिराइव फ्रॉम द नेम एज वेल एज द नेम ऑफ द एनजीओ इज ट्रेड रिलेटेड एनालिसिस ऑफ फोना एंड फ्लोरा इन कॉमर्स एंड even if you don't have the clear idea of what the objective of this ngo is you can easily see that one of those objectives have to be that to ensure that the trade in wild plants and animals is not a threat to the conservation of nature and hence the right answer is b two only now it is important for you to realize that traffic as an ngo appears frequently in the newspapers and out of natural curiosity whenever you come across such organizations or ngos working in the field of environment appearing in the newspaper you should immediately go to their website and get a basic idea about what their functioning is whether india is their member or the work field or not let us now move on to the next question now the next question was asked related to the paris climate deal which was concluded in 2015 and immediately preceding that year in 2016 prelims this was asked and hence it can be said that this was fairly an easy question if you have kept yourself updated with the current affairs now the question is with reference to the agreement at the UNFCC meeting in paris in 2015 which of the following statements is are correct now statement 1 read the agreement was signed by all the member countries of the united nations and it will go into effect in 2017 statement 2 read the agreement aims to limit the greenhouse gas emissions so that the rise in average global temperature by the end of this century does not exceed 2 degree celsius or even 1.5 degree celsius above pre industrial levels whereas statement 3 read developed countries acknowledge their historical responsibility in global warming and committed to donate a thousand billion dollars which means around a trillion dollar a year from 2020 to help developing countries to cope with the climate change so this question is a classic demonstration of those upsc questions where you might not be aware of all the statements and their correctness but still you can solve the question if you are even a little bit updated about the current affairs now here i would like to draw your attention towards statement 3 which says that developed countries acknowledge their historical responsibility in global warming which is incorrect even now the plaguing issue related to almost all the climate deals is that developed countries are not ready to accept historical contributions towards carbon dioxide emissions and if they are not ready to acknowledge their contributions towards global warming then how can they agree on donations which is like a compensation for loss and damage and the developed countries including the european union have not agreed to even a small amount of 100 billion dollar over a period of many years then how can they agree on such a large amount of trillion dollar every year from 2020 so this statement overall is wrong on many counts and hence statement 3 is clearly incorrect so let's now analyze all the options a b c d to find out whether we are able to arrive at the right answer just on the basis of this statement so you can clearly see that option a option c and option d are rejected as all of them contain 3 and now you are left with only b that is 2 only and hence the right answer is b but nonetheless let's now discuss the other two statements as well now the statement one is also incorrect as the agreement was supposed to go into effect from 2020 and not in 2017 and hence statement one is also incorrect whereas second statement is true as one of the main focus of the agreement is to hold the increase in global average temperatures to well below 2 degree celsius above pre industrial level and on driving efforts to limit it even further that is within 1.5 degree celsius of pre industrial levels and it covers all the crucial areas identified as essential for a comprehensive and balanced agreement including mitigation adaptation loss and damage finance technology transfer and development capacity building and important actions to be taken regarding containment of global warming and hence only statement 2 is correct 
So an important takeaway from this question is that whenever you see multiple statements in a single question, you should not get panicked and first coolly and calmly analyze all the statements. And while analyzing these statements, you might find a fact or a line which makes that particular statement exaggerated, which is contradicted to what you have read in newspapers, magazines, as well as in static subjects. And hence, on the basis of that, you can easily solve that question. So let's now move on to the next question. Now, the next question which we have taken up is regarding UNCCD or United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. Now, the question reads, what is our, the importance of UNCCD? Statement one, it aims to promote effective action through innovative national programs and supportive international partnerships. Statement two, it has a special or particular focus on South Asia and North Africa regions and its secretariat facilitates the allocation of major portion of financial resources to these regions. And statement three reads, it is committed to bottom up approach, encouraging the participation of local people in combating desertification. So you have to solve this question on the basis of these three statements. Now, this is not that question where a statement appears to be exaggerated or quite contradictory to the common sense. And this is one of those questions where you need to judge each and every statements for its veracity. So we will do that one by one. Now the statement one reads, it aims to promote effective action through innovative national programs and supportive international partnerships. Now this statement is correct. In order to give you a little bit of context regarding UNCCD and how desertification became so important, it began in 1992 where in Rio Earth Summit, desertification was identified as one of the greatest challenges facing sustainable development and well-being of the earth along with climate change and loss of biodiversity. And hence, subsequently in 1994, UNCCD was established and it is the sole legally binding international agreement linking environment and development to sustainable land management by preventing desertification. So the agreement of UNCCD acknowledges the fact that one of the most important challenges which the countries across the world are facing is that of desertification and it is legally binding for all the parties and it aims to promote effective action through innovative national programs. So what it does is that it encourages the nation states to come up with the programs which are suited in their own context and UNCCD promotes them. So this statement is correct. Whereas statement two is clearly wrong as UNCCD does not have any priority or focus area. The priorities of UNCCD are to combat desertification anywhere across the world and hence the statement about UNCCD being particularly worried about the regions in North Africa and South Asia is incorrect. And also the second part of this statement about allocation of financial resources is incorrect as UNCCD is not involved in major financial allocations. Rather, the main function of Secretariat of UNCCD is to facilitate cooperation between developed and developing countries, particularly about knowledge and technology transfer as far as sustainable land management is concerned. So the main task of UNCCD is not to fund projects to stop desertification but rather it is to facilitate cooperation and the statement three is true not just about UNCCD but in general across the world most of the international organizations have realized that the programs which they run are not going to be effective if they do not involve local people in any of their functions and hence increasingly the international organizations, especially United Nations, have adopted the bottoms-up approach. And UNCCD is particularly committed to bottoms-up approach, encouraging the participation of local people in combating desertification and land degradation. And hence, this statement is also correct, which leads us to the right answer C, 1 and 3 only. Let's now move on to the next question. Now, the next question is about UN Red Plus program or reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. Now the question reads, which of the following statements is are correct? 
proper design and effective implementation of UN Red Plus program can significantly contribute to Statement 1 Protection of Biodiversity Statement 2 Resilience of Forest Ecosystems and Statement 3 is Poverty Reduction. Now before discussing the statements, let's first understand UN Red Plus program. Now you know that in last decades, various studies have estimated that land use change especially from forest or agriculture to that of construction like buildings and developing cities lead to deforestation and forest degradation and this account for around 15 to 20 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions now don't get confused with the word emission it's just that replacement of forest or their degradation leads to the reduction in the amount of carbon dioxide which can be absorbed from the atmosphere. So you obviously know that trees and forests absorb a lot of carbon dioxide and hence reducing the global warming. But replacement of those forests lead to the reduction in the absorption or the removal of the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and hence it ultimately leads to global warming. And to counter that, this Red Plus program has been designed, which is an abbreviation of reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. So according to the United Nations, removal of forests is same as you are adding that much of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and hence we need to counter that. So you can see that obviously, if you know just this information, you can easily see that protection of biodiversity and increasing resilience of forest ecosystem is just a corollary of preservation of forest and prevention of land degradation. So statement 1 and 2 are obviously both correct. So you are left with option A and option D as these two are the only ones which contain both 1 and 2 together. Now the question is about whether 3 is correct or not. And statement 3 is also correct because you think about the forest that landless people and those people who are living below the poverty line use the common property resources of their own villages for various kinds of needs from fruits to the timber which they use as a fuel and the removal of the forest from their surrounding areas lead to the elevation in the levels of poverty and hence preservation of these forests as envisioned by Red Plus program will definitely lead to poverty reduction because it will help the most downtrodden of the society and hence the right answer is option D all 1, 2 and 3 are correct. So let us now discuss 4 practice questions related to international organizations especially those one which have been in news in year 2019 and 20. So starting with the practice question 1 which deals with Convention on the Conservation of Migratory Species of Wild Animals abbreviated as CMS. The question reads, with reference to the 13th Conference of Parties of Convention on the Conservation of Migratory Species of Wild Animals held in 2020, which of the following statements is are correct? Statement 1. CMS is an Environmental Treaty of United Nations. And Statement 2 is, it is the only global convention specializing in the conservation of migratory species. So let's now discuss the answer first and then we will understand few basic facts about CMS. Now it is true that CMS is an environmental treaty of United Nations. So as we just discussed in last four previous year questions that it is important for us to know about global conventions and the organizations under which they were agreed upon and similarly the CMS was agreed upon under the on the platform of United Nations and hence it is a treaty of UN. So statement 1 is correct. Similarly statement 2 is also correct and it is important for you to know that it is one and the only global convention which specifically deals with the conservation of migratory species and hence both of the statements are correct. And hence the right answer is C, both 1 and 2. Let's now quickly understand what CMS stands for. Now you know that a lot of species of wild animals are subjected to various kinds of protection as they migrate from one territory to another. So for example, let's take the case of Great Indian Bustard 
or GIB. And you know that there are only 150 Great Indian Bustards left on the planet. Now the problem with the Great Indian Bustard and its preservation is that it is a migratory species and it oscillates between the Western India and Eastern Pakistan. Now as far as the conservation status in India is concerned, it is protected as Schedule 1 animal under Wildlife Protection Act 1972, which means that its hunting or any kind of harm to the bustard is punishable offense in India. But on contradictory, in Pakistan, the government of Pakistan actively promotes the hunting by issuing licenses to the rich people, especially from the Middle East. They come for the hunting by obtaining the licenses by paying huge amounts and that makes it legal there. So you can see that the conservation of migratory species becomes very difficult because they migrate from one territory to another with various levels of protection and hence the need was felt to provide them with minimum level of protection not only in the source and destination but also from where they pass through. And this is the main agenda behind CMS. So what CMS does is that it categorizes the species into Appendix 1 and 2. And obviously the Appendix 1 species are those which are critically endangered and hence they demand higher level of protection. Whereas species in Appendix 2 are those which are not critically endangered but they would significantly benefit from international cooperation. Now. It becomes important because the 13th Conference of Parties to the Convention on Conservation of Migratory Species of Wild Animals just concluded in Gandhinagar in February 2020. And it led to the listing of 10 migratory species of the world on Appendix 1 and 2. Now three species become very important which we shall discuss in the section of the species which are Great Indian Bustard, Bengal Florican and the Asian Elephant. Now these three species got enlisted in Appendix 1 of the convention from India. So for this year's preliminary examination, the basics about CMS as well as these three species, Great Indian Bustard, Bengal Florican and Asiatic Elephant become important. Let's now move on to the second practice question. Now the next question is about the 25th annual talks under UNFCCC referred to as Conference of Parties 25, which was held in Madrid in December 2019, which was two months ago. Now it was the longest conference of parties ever. Now since these conference of parties are held every two years, they become important from the perspective of both prelims as well as mains examination. So let's now consider this question. The question reads, with reference to UNFCC meeting in Madrid, Conference of Parties 25, which of the following statements is our correct? Statement 1. It led to the finalization of Article 6 of the Paris Climate Deal. Statement 2 is there was a broad agreement on the compensation for loss and damage issue. Whereas statement 3 reads agreement on enhanced gender action plan was finalized. Now if you have read the newspapers or our focus magazine, you can easily solve this question as the news related to the non-finalization of Article 6, which basically means the rules for new carbon market to be set up under Paris Agreement could not be finalized and this was the main agenda over which the Conference of Parties 25 was organized. And the countries around the world, especially European Union, India and China, they were hoping that it would lead to the finalization of these rules under Article 6 of the Paris Climate Deal and it could not be done and hence Statement 1 is incorrect. Similarly, the developing countries have always demanded compensation for the loss and damage which they have undergone due to the impact of climate change and global warming which has been mainly contributed by the developed countries. And hence, developing countries demand the compensation because in the global warming and climate change which we see today, the main reasons are the carbon emissions from the developed countries. But the consequences are borne more by the developing countries in form of erratic weather, increased frequency of disasters and many other factors. But there was no such agreement on this issue as well and hence statement 2 is also incorrect. 
So if you are able to reject 1 and 2, you are obviously rejecting option A, C as well as D and you are left with only option B3 only which is correct as all the countries agreed on enhanced gender action plan. Let's now move on to the next question. The practice question number 3 deals with the Ramsar Convention. As you might be aware that 10 wetlands have been added to the Ramsar site list from India and hence it becomes important to revisit the Ramsar Convention. Now the question is which of the following are not included as wetlands by Ramsar Convention? Statement 1 marshes, statement 2 floodplains, 3 peatlands, 4 corals and 5 man-made wetlands. So before going into the answer, let's first discuss few things about Ramsar Convention. Now the Convention on Wetlands also known as Ramsar which is in Iran was finalized in 1971 and it is an intergovernmental treaty. So one of the most important thing to keep in mind is that Ramsar does not include any other party except for the government. So it is an intergovernmental treaty whose mission is the conservation and wise use of all wetlands through local, regional and national actions and international cooperation. So around 1900 wetlands from around the world have been designated for inclusion in the Ramsar list of wetlands of international importance and in the same list 10 new wetlands have been added from India. Now the question arises that what are those water bodies which are eligible to be included as wetlands of international importance in Ramsar list. Now as defined by the convention, wetlands can be a wide variety of habitats of water bodies such as marshes, peatlands, floodplains, rivers and lakes, coastal areas such as mangroves, salt marshes, seagrass beds. But it also includes coral reefs and other marine areas no deeper than 6 meters at low tide. So you see that whatever we have spoken, marshes, floodplains, peatlands and corals as well as marine areas no deeper than 6 meters are eligible to be included in wetlands of international importance. And hence 1, 2, 3, 4 all are correct. Now the question remains of man-made wetlands and according to Ramsar convention, these human-made wetlands like reservoirs and dams are also eligible to be included. Apart from these, other human-made wetlands such as wastewater treatment ponds are also eligible. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 all of these are eligible and hence the right answer is none of the above as all of them can be included as wetlands but the question asks which of the following are not included as wetlands. So this is an important piece of information regarding Ramsar Convention as it is not intuitive that man-made wetlands as well as floodplains will also be included as wetlands of international importance. Now from the perspective of prelims examination, you should memorize all the Ramsar wetlands in India currently which are around 37 in number including the 10 which have been recently added. And it is also important for you to have some idea about them. And if you memorize them, it becomes very easy to derive these options because you will find many man-made wetlands included in the list of Ramsar sites in India. For example, Bhoj wetland. Now Bhoj wetland is a Ramsar site which was designated as such in 2002. Now Bhoj wetland consists of two lakes located in the city of Bhopal. Now these two are Bhojtal and the lower lake and both of them are man-made reservoirs. And UPSC has also asked questions related to these Ramsar sites in the past as well. Let's now move on to the next practice question. The next practice question is about United Nations Development Program or UNDP. The question reads, with reference to UNDP, which of the following statements is are correct? Statement 1. Its parent organization is ECOSOC or United Nations Economic and Social Council and statement 2 reads it seeks to address environmental issues in developing countries. Now this question has been specifically designed to give you an insight that you have to be careful while reading the question. Although the question is about United Nations Development Program which will immediately make you to think that how can it deal with the environmental issues but 
these both statements are correct as it functions under ECOSOC as well as it also works in the field of environmental issues. And let us understand how. Now as we know that United Nations Development Program is the United Nations Global Development Network and the special emphasis of UNDP is on least development countries as far as their development is concerned. And environmental issues are one such aspect which prevent these least development countries from developing in their full potential. So apart from functioning in governance, poverty reduction, crisis prevention and recovery, as well as in dealing with diseases like HIV AIDS, UNDP also functions in environment and energy field. As the poor are disproportionately affected by the environmental degradation and lack of access to clean, affordable water, and sanitation facilities, UNDP seeks to address environmental issues in order to improve developing countries' abilities to develop sustainably. And hence, by doing this, it tries to reduce the levels of poverty in LDC countries. So both 1 and 2 are correct. So the important takeaway from this question is that you should try to think a little bit beyond what you have read. And similarly, you should try to connect the statements from the question. So for example, in this case, it says that United Nations Development Program seeks to address environmental issues. So obviously, one of the important aspect of development is how you are managing your environment and surroundings. So after discussing four questions related to international organizations, it's time for us to move on to the national initiatives. Now we'll start the discussion on the section on national initiatives. Now, we have categorized those questions under this section which deal with the mechanisms, laws and various kinds of instruments created inside India to protect environment, biodiversity, flora and fauna. So we have taken a set of four questions to demonstrate the diversity of questions which are asked. Now the displayed on the screen are two of them. First one was asked in 2017 which asks, in India, if a species of tortoise is declared protected under Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act 1972, what does it imply? Option A. It enjoys the same level of protection as that of tiger. Statement B. It no longer exists in the wild. A few individuals are under captive protection and now it is impossible to prevent its extinction. Statement C. It is endemic to a particular region of India. Whereas statement D reads, both B and C stated above are correct in this context. So an important takeaway from this is that you should understand the five schedules of Wildlife Protection Act and it deals with the protection of both plants as well as animals. And the number of schedules starting from one are in decreasing order of protection level. So the various aspects of Wildlife Protection Act has been discussed in details many times in our DNS videos as well as in our Focus magazine. They are also included in our Compass magazine. Now getting back to the question. Now you know that the Wildlife Protection Act provides for the protection of wild animals, birds and plants. It has six schedules which give varying degrees of protection. Now schedule 1 and part 2 of the schedule 2 provide absolute protection which means that offenses against animals and plants included in Schedule 1 attract highest level of penalties. And hence, if a species of tortoise is declared as protected under Schedule 1, it means that it enjoys the same level of protection as that of tiger, which is also a Schedule 1 animal under Wildlife Protection Act. So the answer is option A. But let us now discuss B and C as well. Now statement B is basically a category of IUCN which is International Union for the Conservation of Nature which is denoted by the name of extinct in the wild that has living members kept only in captivity and there is no naturalized population of that species in the wild. So this is extinct in wild and it does not mean that it will be a scheduled one animal under Wildlife Protection Act and hence it is incorrect. Similarly, the statement C that it is endemic to a particular region of India has no such criteria for classification under Schedule 1 and hence it is also incorrect. And since both B and C are incorrect, obviously it means that option D is also incorrect. 
So Wildlife Protection Act 1972 is the basic framework under which the biodiversity of the country is protected and hence it is important for you to memorize few of the important species included in Schedule 1 and the Schedule 1 species which frequently appear in newspapers are pangolin, great indian bustard, tiger and various others. Let's now move on to the next question. Now the next question was asked in 2014 and dealt with eco-sensitive zones. The question read, with reference to eco-sensitive zones, which of the following statements is are correct? Statement 1. Eco-sensitive zones are the areas that are declared under Wildlife Protection Act 1972. And the statement 2 read, the purpose of the declaration of eco-sensitive zones is to prohibit all kinds of human activities in those zones except agriculture. Now at the outset it needs to be stated that both these statements are incorrect. As eco-sensitive zones are declared under Environmental Protection Act 1986 and the activities which are prohibited are generally specific to each zones and notified separately and there is no common rule that all kinds of human activities shall be prohibited in such zones and hence the right answer is D neither one nor two. Now in order to understand the need for declaration of these eco-sensitive zones you need to realize that declaring an area as protected area for example as a national park or a wildlife sanctuary is not sufficient because we need to protect the areas immediately surrounding these protected areas as well and for that purpose these eco-sensitive zones have been created. Now these eco-sensitive zones are an additional tool to strengthen the buffer areas as well as the corridors which connect to protected areas. Now in 2002, Government of India decided to notify lands falling within 10 kilometers of the boundaries of national parks and sanctuaries as eco fragile zones or eco-sensitive zones under Environmental Protection Act 1986. Now each and every eco-sensitive zone is notified through a separate notification and all those prohibited activities are mentioned in such a document. So both these statements are incorrect leading us to the right answer D neither one nor two. Let's now move on to the next question. The next question was asked in 2012. The National Green Tribunal Act 2010 was enacted in consonance with which of the following provisions of the Constitution of India? Statement 1. Right to healthy environment construed as a part of right to life under Article 21. Statement 2. Provision of grants for raising the level of administration in the scheduled areas for the welfare of scheduled tribes under Article 275.1. And Statement 3 reads powers and functions of Gram Sabha as mentioned under Article 243a. Now NGT or National Green Tribunal is a tribunal created to handle cases related to environmental issues. Now it was created under National Green Tribunal Act 2010 as given in the question but the inspiration was drawn from Article 21 of the Indian Constitution which assures the citizens of India right to life and personal liberty. So statement 1 is obviously correct. Now let us analyze statement 2 and 3. Now Article 275 deals with the grants from the union to certain states and these grants are related to the welfare of scheduled areas and scheduled tribes as written in the statement but there is no such mention of creation of any kind of tribunal dealing with the environmental issues and hence statement 2 is incorrect. Now moving on to the statement 3. Now article 243a is that article which creates the Gram Sabha and says that a Gram Sabha may exercise such powers and perform such functions at the village level as the legislature of the state may by law provide. So there is no mention of creation of any kind of tribunal in this article also and hence this statement is also incorrect which leads us to the right answer one only which is A. So in this regard it becomes important for us to understand that three or four acts mainly Wildlife Protection Act, Environmental Protection Act, National Green Tribunal Act and the basic provisions related to these acts become important from the perspective of prelims examination. Now this last question dealing with the national initiatives has been taken from 
2011 prelims examination. The question reads, with reference to India, consider the following central acts. The first act, Import and Export Control Act 1947. The second act, Mining and Mineral Development Regulation Act 1957. The third act, Customs Act 1962. And fourth act, Indian Forest Act 1927. Now the question asks, which of the above acts have relevance to or bearing on the biodiversity conservation in the country? So basically it wants you to know or decipher which of the acts mentioned in these options have some of the provisions related to flora or fauna. Now there is a particular reason why we have chosen this question. The simple reason is that it is simply not possible to cover all these acts while preparing for UPSC. It is beyond the scope and capabilities of almost all the students to prepare so many acts at the same time. But an application of common sense can lead you to the right answer. Now first consider Indian Forest Act. Now it is an act to consolidate the laws relating to the forest, forest produce and various other aspects related to forest. So obviously the right answer should must contain option 4. And hence by agreeing that Indian Forest Act 1927 must be included in the right answer, you have already removed A as well as D. So now what you remain with is B or C and both have 2, 3 and 4. So as a corollary of Indian Forest Act 1927 being correct, you have already made sure that 2 and 3 are correct. And now you are left with Import Export Control Act 1947. Now while deciding between B and C and trying to find out whether Import and Export Control Act 1947 has a bearing on biodiversity conservation or not, just think about the fact that whenever you read newspaper, many a times you find news related to illegal smuggling as well as import and export of various stuff related to wildlife, either the skin of pangolin or the teeth of elephant and various other things. So is it possible that an act created to control import and export, basically the trade, will not have any item related to biodiversity conservation? And obviously the answer is no, it is not possible. An Import and Export Control Act 1947 must include items related to biodiversity conservation, which leads us to the right answer 1, 2, 3 and 4. So what this question teaches us is that it is not important to know each and every option or statement, but the focus should be on preparing static syllabus as well as current affairs related information and then apply your mind while you are there in the examination hall appearing for the prelims. Let's now move ahead and solve few practice questions related to national initiatives. Now the first practice question which we have taken deals with the Environment Impact Assessment or EIA. Now if you remember in the past year question papers, we discussed a question about eco-sensitive zones. And similarly, we have framed this question regarding environment impact assessment. So the question reads, with reference to environment impact assessment or EIA, which of the following statements is are correct? Statement 1. National Green Tribunal or NGT issues the notification regarding EIAs in India. Statement 2 reads, EIA notification is issued under Section 3 of Environment Protection Act 1986. Now this question has been specifically framed because the Environment Ministry has recently granted exemption to oil and gas firms from seeking environmental clearances as far as drilling for exploration is concerned. Now this step has been taken by the Government of India to incentivize the private firms to explore more and more areas in India as far as oil and gas reserves are concerned. Now, environment impact assessment, as you know, is a planning tool to integrate the environmental concerns into developmental processes right at the initial stage of planning. You have seen that lack of planning and especially the environmental aspect of planning may lead to disaster consequences. For example, while planning a dam, if the consequences on biodiversity are not taken care of, then it might lead to substantial loss of both flora and fauna. So you can say that EIA essentially refers to the assessment of environmental impacts likely to arise from a project. Now an important piece of information regarding EIAs are 
that Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change is the nodal ministry for notifying the EIA notification under Section 3 of Environmental Protection Act. And hence the statement 1 is incorrect whereas statement 2 is correct. Which leads us to the right answer B 2 only. Now it is interesting to note that how come EIA comes from EPA 1986. Now under section 3 of EPA the act empowers the central government to take all measures that it deems necessary for the purpose of protecting and improving the quality of the environment and preventing and controlling environmental pollution. And the central government has utilized the power sanctioned under section 3 to issue notifications from time to time. Now it is important to know that currently the EIA framework is governed by the notification issued in 2006. In our focus magazine of month January, we have discussed various stages related to the environment impact assessment, basically screening, scoping, public consultation and appraisal stage. We have also discussed various issues which plague the EIA assessment in India currently and how to resolve them. So it is advisable that you go through that document to understand the environmental impact assessment framework in the country in great detail. Let's now move on to the next question. Now next question deals with India State of the Forest Report 2019. Now in 2019, India State of the Forest Report was published by Forest Survey of India. Now this institute has been mandated to assess the forest and tree resources of the country including wall-to-wall -wall forest cover mapping. And in this regard, this question becomes important from the perspective of prelims examination. So let's now consider this question. With reference to India's State of the Forest Report 2019, consider the following statements. Now the statement 1 reads, It is a decadal report which assesses the state of Indian forests. Now this statement is incorrect as this report is biennial. And since 1987, 16 such reports have been published. The last one being published in 2017 and this one in 2019. So statement 1 is clearly wrong. And now you can easily solve this question with the help of this statement being wrong. Which leads us to the right answer B 2 only. Nonetheless, we will discuss all the options. Now the second statement says 2019 report is based upon satellite data. Now this statement is correct as in tune with Government of India's vision of Digital India, the Forest Survey of India's assessment is largely based on digital data which is derived from satellites, vector boundaries of districts and various other kinds of data analysis techniques such as GIS. So the information from a satellite known as Resource Sat 2 was utilized for making such a report but it was also coupled with field visits by the forest officials to verify that satellite data. Now statement 3 reads, Mizoram has the highest area under forest cover in India. Now this statement is incorrect because as far as the largest forest cover area is concerned, the state is Madhya Pradesh followed by Arunachal Pradesh and Chhattisgarh. But Mizoram tops the list as far as percentage of forest area under the forest is concerned. So you should keep in mind these small details while reading out the statements. Apart from this, it is important for us to understand why the Indian State of the Forest Report which is published every two years is important as far as the forest conservation is concerned. What is the difference between forest cover and recorded forest area? What is National Forest Inventory? What are the key findings of the reports which was published in 2019? And what are the limitations of these kinds of reports especially which are dependent on satellite data. Now for understanding these details it is advisable that you go through our focus magazine published in January 2020 as you will find these details there. Let us now move on to the next question. Now this question deals with management effectiveness evaluation of tiger reserves or METR meter. With reference to meter, consider the following statements. Statement 1. Management effectiveness evaluation analysis was done for all the 50 tiger reserves in the country. Whereas statement 2 reads, Satyamangalam Tiger Reserve in Tamil Nadu secured the highest MEE score. Now you might ask that why this management effectiveness evaluation of tiger reserves is important. 
Now it is important because towards the end of 2018, the fourth cycle of report was released. Now to understand the significance of such an assessment, you should know that survival of tigers is dependent on conservation and management efforts. But only that is not sufficient. You must have heard that what does not get measured does not get improved. And hence, to gauge the success of conservation efforts as well as to guide management inputs, it is important to assess the effectiveness of these management exercises being conducted in various kinds of tiger reserves in India. Now the trigger for MEE was the disappearance of tigers in Sariska tiger reserves which prompted the then Prime Minister to direct Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change to conduct independent audit of tiger reserves and place a report before the parliament and since then it has continued. So in the end of 2018, MEE exercise was carried out in all the 50 tiger reserves in the country and hence statement 1 is correct. Now in the fourth cycle of MEE for tiger reserves, it was found out that Penj Tiger Reserve which is in Madhya Pradesh and Periyar Tiger Reserve which is in Kerala secured highest analysis score which means that they are at the top as far as the conservation and management of tigers inside these reserves are concerned and hence statement 2 is incorrect because it says that Satyamangalam Tiger Reserve in Tamil Nadu secured the highest MEE score. But Satyamangalam Tiger Reserve also found the place in the report because it showed the highest improvement or increment in management techniques since the last cycle which was the third one. And hence this leads us to the right answer A, one only. Now as far as the states are concerned, Kerala secured the highest score followed by the Tamil Nadu. And it is important for you to know that 42% of tiger reserves fell in very good management category whereas 34% in good category and rest 24% fell in the fair category and it is heartening to know that none of the tiger reserves management techniques was rated as poor. Now it becomes important from the perspective of prelims examination to know these things because UPSC has already asked questions related to M stripes which also deals with the conservation of the tigers. Let's now move on to the next question. Now this last question dealing with the national initiatives deals with conservation assured. With reference to conservation assured, consider the following statements. Statement 1. It is an initiative of World Wide Fund for Nature which is WWF and statement 2 reads the first species specific CA standards are for the tiger. Now conservation assured appears frequently in newspaper related to tiger and the first species which has been chosen under conservation assured is tiger and hence statement 2 is correct. It is an initiative of World Wide Fund for Nature WWF and hence statement 1 is also correct. Now conservation assured is a new conservation tool to set minimum standards for effective management of target species and to encourage assessment of these standards in relevant conservation or protected areas. So it is quite similar to what we just discussed in METER. MWETER was an initiative of Indian government whereas Conservation Assured is an initiative of WWF which aims to develop minimum standards which are applicable globally and which will help the range countries of various kinds of species assess what they are doing is correct or not, how they can improve upon their current practices and what are the global best practices which they can integrate with their current system. Now as we just discussed that the first species which has been chosen is Panthera tigris or tiger and this is known as CA oblique TS. Informally it is known as cats. So this is for tigers. Similarly, similarly WWF might come with conservation assured for a separate species and hence these two letters will be replaced. So this leads us to the right answer C both 1 and 2. Now as we know that under T into 2 the 13 range countries of tiger have chosen an ambitious goal of doubling the global tiger population by 2022. Now this CATS which is conservation assured standards are going to play a key role in helping these countries in achieving the set target. So you should keep in mind that CATS is a minimum management tool which sets basic criteria or the minimum standards for effective management of tiger conservation reserves or other conservation reserves and protected areas which have tiger populations. 
Let's now move on to the next section. Now let us discuss these two questions from previous year's UPSC examination as far as the theory of environment, ecology and biodiversity is concerned. Now these two questions have been specifically chosen because they explain two very important concepts. Let's consider this first question asked in 2013. With reference to food chains in ecosystems, consider the following statements. Statement 1 reads, a food chain illustrates the order in which a chain of organisms feed upon each other. Statement 2 reads, food chains are found within the populations of a species. And statement 3 reads, a food chain illustrates the numbers of each organism which are eaten by others. Now any standard textbook of environment and ecology will tell you what a food chain is. So basically, you know that every organism must eat some other organism in order to survive. And hence, a food chain is a sequence of organisms in which each one preys on the preceding one. And the food chain shows the predator-prey relationship. For example, grasshoppers eat grasses, which are indeed eaten by the mouse. In turn, snake eats the mouse. And finally, hawk sits on top of each one of them eating the snake. So this is a food chain and hence statement 1 which says that a food chain illustrates the order in which a chain of organisms feed upon each other is correct. Now food chain shows the hierarchy of relationships among various species living in the same area. But it does not depict the relationship among a population of a same species and hence statement 2 is incorrect. Statement 3 is also incorrect because food chain does not illustrate or talks about any kind of numbers of each organisms which are eaten by others and hence the right answer is A, one only. Similarly, a very good question regarding concept or theory of environment was asked in 2011 and that's why it has been chosen. Statement reads, consider the following statements. Biodiversity is normally greater in the lower latitudes as compared to the higher latitudes. And statement 2 reads, along the mountain gradients, biodiversity is normally greater in the lower altitudes as compared to higher altitudes. Now this particular question deals with the tolerance ranges of species. It is shaped in the form of bell or normal distribution. The y-axis of this curve shows the number of individuals whereas the x-axis plots the environmental conditions. So you see that if environmental conditions go beyond a certain limit or in fact go below a certain limit the number of population or the number of organisms decline whereas the number is highest in between them. So this is an important concept of ecology. And if you analyze these two statements, you can easily derive the answer. For example, statement 1 reads, biodiversity is normally greater in the lower latitudes as compared to higher latitudes. Now, the higher latitudes have extreme of temperature, especially the cold temperature. And hence, the number of species will have to decline it as it will fall below a certain environmental limit. And hence, the number of living organisms which can tolerate this extreme environmental condition will decline greatly. And hence, the number of species which can tolerate such extreme temperatures will decline, leading to the decline in biodiversity. Hence, statement 1 is correct. Now, the statement 2 reads, along the mountain gradients, biodiversity is normally greater in lower altitudes as compared to higher altitudes. Now again, this is similar to the statement 1 because as you rise up along the mountains, the temperatures decline and hence, which again forms the similar kind of environmental conditions which are found at higher latitudes and hence it will lead to decline in biodiversity as compared to those of lower altitudes. So statement 2 is also correct which leads us to the right answer both 1 and 2. So UPSC from time to time keeps on asking questions related to the static portion or the conceptual portion of environment and ecology. And it is advisable that you go through those concepts before appearing in the prelims examination. In our Compass magazine, we have also provided these concepts dealing with environment and ecology section.
So it is advisable that you can go through that as well. Now the first question deals with the ecological pyramids. The question reads, consider the following about ecological pyramids. First, pyramid of energy flow. Second, pyramid of numbers. Third, pyramid of biomass. The question asks, which of the above can never be inverted? So let us first understand this concept of ecological pyramids. As we go up the trophic levels, beginning with the producers, we will see change in ecologically important parameters such as total energy, amount of biomass and the number of organisms in each species. Now ecological pyramids depict this change in the form of diagrams. The term pyramid indicates the fact that parameters generally reduce in quantity as we move up the trophic levels, something like this. So this kinds of form a pyramid. So the question specifically asks that which of the above can never be inverted, which means that generally the pyramids are shaped this way, but in certain conditions the pyramid can also be like this, which means that as we go up the trophic level, the numbers or the energy or the biomass increases and the question asks which of these three pyramid can never be shaped like this and the answer is that pyramid of energy flow can never be inverted but this is not always the case with the numbers and the biomass so this leads us to the right answer a one only as the pyramid of energy flow can never be inverted to give you an example about how the pyramid of numbers can be inverted you take the example of forest. Now in a forest, a single tree, which is a producer, so that will form the first level of trophic, may support a very large number of herbivorous insects or the consumers, which will increase the number of the second trophic level. And hence you see the pyramid has been inverted. Similarly, in case of biomass also, you should know that in oceans sometimes, the total biomass of large and long-lived fish could exceed the total biomass of small and short-lived phytoplanktons, which is at lower trophic level. And hence, in that case also, the pyramid will be inverted. So it is important for you to understand these energy flows, the pyramids of numbers as well as pyramid of biomass, because these concepts are very basic, easy to understand, and UPSC can also ask them. Now moving on to this last question regarding nitrogen cycle. Consider the following regarding nitrogen cycle. Statement 1. It is limited to air and soil. Statement 2. It involves nitrogen fixation and ammonification only. Statement 3. Atmospheric nitrogen has limited availability for biological use. Now as you know that nitrogen cycle is the biogeochemical cycle by which nitrogen is converted into multiple chemical forms as it circulates or transitions among atmosphere terrestrial bodies as well as marine ecosystems and hence statement 1 is incorrect because it says that it is limited to air and soil. Now the conversion of nitrogen can be carried out through both biological as well as physical processes. Now important processes in nitrogen cycle include fixation, ammonification, nitrification and denitrification and hence statement 2 is incorrect as it says it involves nitrogen fixation and ammonification only. Now as you know that the majority of earth's atmosphere that is around 78% is atmosphere nitrogen making it the largest source of nitrogen. However, this atmospheric nitrogen has very limited availability for biological use because the organisms do not have the capacity to absorb atmospheric nitrogen like they do for oxygen or carbon dioxide, hence leading to a scarcity of usable nitrogen in many types of ecosystem. And that's where the role of nitrogen fixation comes in. And hence statement 3 is correct, which leads us to the right answer C, 3 only. So with this, we have come to the end of first video of environment. In the next video, we are going to take up questions related to national parks, tiger reserves and various other kinds of questions especially related to the possibilities.